Hello, everybody. Welcome to Ad Week Together. Uh, this is our daily live show at Ad Week, where we are bringing together our staff members uh, with our readers and with our viewers um, every day at one o'clock Eastern time here in the US. I see that we've got people uh, tuning in from the Netherlands, from India, uh, from Portland, from Seoul, from Amsterdam. So um, thank you all for joining us today. I really appreciate it. Um, today, we're going to be talking about a few interesting things. Um, we have a staff member uh, here today, Ko Im, who is our department's editor. You also might know her as the voice, as the co-host of our podcast, Yeah, That's Probably an Ad, uh, which comes out weekly. And I think a new episode just dropped today. Ko, thank you so much for being with us. Yeah, it's um, really nice to be with you and with the Adweek community. I'm here in Seoul. Yes. So yeah, Co has such an interesting perspective, not just as an Adweek editor, but also um, she made the decision recently to go to South Korea uh, to be with family. Um, she also is a certified yoga instructor and very kind of connected with the wellness space. So we're going to be talking about a couple things today. One is an inside view from South Korea, uh, which I'm really curious to hear from you, Ko, about how things are playing out there um, compared with your experience in New York. And then we're going to dive into how the coronavirus is affecting the wellness industry. And I think there's a lot of, you know, there's some good news, bad news there, right? Um, so, Ko, for starters, can you just tell us a bit more? I know that it was it was a big decision for you to take the flight back to South Korea, just with um, you know some of the uh, the risks of traveling these days. Um, what what made you decide to go back? Yeah, I mean, you know, un unfortunately, you know, I had to address a personal family matter, um, so it wasn't an easy decision to make, like you said, and I really weighed the risks of getting on a plane, going through multiple airports. Um, but I also knew that, you know, I was coming home to family um, and that South Korea um, is in a relatively, you know, good state in terms of flattening its curve. Um, so I was very vigilant about traveling, um, had my mask on, had Lysol air sprays and, wiping everything down. Um, and, you know, when I left New York, we were just really starting to do the social distancing, um, maybe doing one day on, one day off of going into work. Um, but it feels like it was a little too late, as we probably all can feel and, and read about. Um, and here, strangely enough, um, you know, restaurants are still open. People still go to the store without feeling any hysteria. They go to the pharmacy um, and wait in line when it's their turn, depending on their birth year. And you can see in this photo that, you know, they're not uh, necessarily socially distancing, but they're all wearing masks. And that's kind of been part of the culture um, in Korea, this idea of, you know, cleanliness and community um, and really thinking about, you know, what is my place in the world? So people are being very responsible. You're not going to see people hosting parties. Um, we have sanitizers in you know, private office buildings and also sanitizers in public streets. Um, so there's no shortage of um, materials that people need. There's no hysteria. There's no price mark. Um, I was able to order a couple extra that you see over my right shoulder on um, Korea's version of Amazon coupon. And it came like within days. Wow. So you don't see um, you don't see people sort of hoarding and stocking up the way that they are in the US. No, you know, in the storefronts, you see, you know, packs and packs of toilet paper, but nobody's really taking them because they're just kind of going about their day normally. It's a, it's a weird sense of normalcy here. Um, it's not really a new normal, it's just an adjusted normal. And, um, you know, I go to the store with my grandma um, and, you know, there's plenty of food, fresh food. Um, we're not having to kind of eat out of cans, but there is a lot of delivery. So there is, I don't see a lot of people on the buses and in the streets as much, but people are out and about. And where, um, can you give our viewers a sense of where South Korea is on the coronavirus curve in relation to the US? Because it's my understanding that it was one of the first countries that really was hit hard with this. Yes, one of the countries that was hit hard, but also responded very quickly. So. What a lot of experts point to was South Korea's very kind of rigid testing 
and giving information very directly. So, you know, maybe they saw more cases early on, but it was also because they were testing a, an enormous amount of people, even if you were kind of asymptomatic. When I traveled here, before I left the airport, I had to go through a whole system of um, downloading a government issued app um, in which I have to self-diagnose and report any symptoms every day. Um, so, and then I was called um, to, and I recommended to, to take a test. And, um, and I wanna just throw this out for our viewers who are watching on LinkedIn Live as well as Facebook. If you have any questions for Co, please feel free to uh, drop them in the comments, and um, I'll try to pick one out to ask her. So, Ko, I want to I want to ask you a little bit about that. You you uh, just just this past week took a coronavirus test, right? You went through I think a walk up or drive through clinic. Um, and can you tell me what that process was like? It was very easy. Um, I my doctor friends back home in New York said that you know it would be a lot easier for me to get access here and they were right um i was called and recommended to take a test but also people who come to korea after the 25th are kind of required to take the test either way i went to the neighborhood clinic here the neighborhood i'm in is like the jersey city of um souls like manhattan so i went to the neighborhood clinic um, you know, I was told that it would take an hour. It took 20 minutes for me to get swabbed in the nose and the mouth. All I had to do was, you know, show my passport, give them all my um, essential information. And then they said results up to two days, but I actually got a text message on a Sunday about 12 hours later. This is the text message that I got saying that, you know, I am negative, um, but to continue to wash my hands, cover my cough, and also wear a mask. And I, I imagine that was a, a relief, again, after traveling to get that news. Yes, oh, I mean, even just taking the test felt good because you know a lot of people aren't in limbo in the US. It's like, do I have it, do I not? Am I asymptomatic and carrying it and potentially giving it to my grandmother or my sick dad? So you know, it was um, a huge relief uh, for me to get negative results. The only time where you're like, oh, this, I feel good being negative. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I know, and it's interesting here in the US, we have a coworker who was able to drive up and take a test uh, uh, for them and their family. Um, and this person lives in the South and it was very easy, kind of like what you described. Um, but then, you know, I have family in LA and then also here in New York who can't who you know who may have uh, really strong symptoms but can't get a test because there's a shortage so it's interesting how the the testing is so different depending on where you are but congrats on getting that result i i i hear that it's a lot of peace of mind when you're able to actually take the test and know one way or the other right um yeah, and it's interesting a lot too. more <laughs> peace of yeah, mind <laughs> exactly peace of mind um and and you you mentioned this too that once you landed in south korea you were asked to download an app and you've been logging your symptoms every day is that the case for everybody or just for people coming from new york um i believe it's the case for everybody um my brother came in from guam as well um and you get a little um kind of paper certificate that says you've been successfully quarantined at the airport you know they check your temperature at the airport um, if I come back to the U.S., I'm only, you know, given the option of a possible screening. Um, and I wish that there were more um, measures in place already so that we don't have to keep backtracking. And did businesses ever close there or have they stayed open the whole time? So restaurants never fully closed. Shops are still open. Um, malls are still open. Again, not a lot of people go out. This is um, a Starbucks that people young people go to and they, you know, sit relatively distant from each other unless they know each other. Um, schools are closed. So my cousin is finishing her college degree online um, and they probably, you know, will extend that, that, you know, schools being closed. Um, my uncle works at the airport. Um, his hours are being reduced, but I think at least there's like some movement happening here and you don't hear about you know, drastic, massive changes. Yeah. 
I want to um, I want to pivot and talk a bit about the wellness industry. So I know you've you as I mentioned, you're a yoga instructor. You've also done some really fantastic um, live meditations for our readers in recent days and weeks. I know you ended today's podcast with a meditation. Um, what can you tell me about how the wellness industry is faring and adapting at this time? Yeah, so, um, you know, I'm a very, like, community-oriented person, so it kind of saddens me that, you know, we can't be together in person. However, technology is offering an alternative. So just in the way that, um, you know, a lot of conferences or meetings are now held over Zoom, a lot of um, yoga teachers and meditation teachers are turning to video conference platforms um, we, we're seeing that a lot of people are um, downloading and using meditation apps to try to gain some sense of regularity and some, have some space. So, you know, this story that Diana Pearl wrote, um, she also mentioned that, you know, Headspace, for example, is letting in um, healthcare workers um, have access to their app for free. There are other um, platforms like Pop Sugar. Um, our breaking news reporter, Kitty Lundstrom, wrote about how they fast tracked um, their new fitness app called Active by Pop Sugar, um, so that people could have, you know, classes that they would normally go to the gym um, for. So a lot of people are, um, you know, able to, to turn to these resources, even within the agency world, you know, the agency culture is changing and Havas New York, um, Eric Oster um, just wrote a story about how they're going to be um, through an app on the mobile phone not only going to providing a meditation, but also Kundalini Yoga on Instagram Live every day, which I think is a tremendous resource, especially when it comes from, you know, the company overview and knowing that, okay, we're in this for the long run and we also need this right now. Yeah, it is inter It is interesting to see. And tomorrow we're actually going to talk about this a bit more, um, just agency culture and agency life right now in the time of Corona. And it is interesting to see um, corporations turn their attention um, to these sort of wellness apps and resources. Uh, I was just talking to our CEO at Adweek this morning, whose wife is a corporate wellness instruct instructor. And they were worried that, you know, her business would suffer um, with so many people going remote, but the opposite has been the case. It's grown threefold because um, businesses are really recognizing the need for employees sort of mental, emotional, physical well-being. Um, you know, uh, in, in order to keep doing their jobs well. Um, I think it's, it's interesting you mentioned Headspace um, and the story that uh, Diana Pearl wrote because uh, some interesting things came out of that. One is that Headspace let us know that um, they have a meditation called Stressed and that that was downloaded 13 times more uh, than the previous 30 days. Um, and so you can, it, it just w watching some of this data, you can kind of get a sense of the public mood. Um, also, I think they were really smart in pivoting their content. Um, they created a new series called Weathering the Storm. That's purely to help people get through um, coronavirus. And they're looking into creating uh, resources for kids and sort of explaining to kids what's going on and helping them not feel so anxious about it. So it's, uh, I think it's neat to see how, how quickly people have been able to create content to fill that need. Um, another thing that came up too is just the tone uh, that we're seeing in communications from, from the wellness industry. Uh, there's an app called Breathe with three E's <laughs> that they, we talked to their marketing director who said that they're really trying to keep an optimistic tone. I wonder what you're seeing there. You probably get a lot of emails um, from different, you know, studios. How how do you feel it's being handled? What's the best approach on the marketing front um, in terms of, you know, how you talk to your customers right now? You know, um, you mentioned, you know, how a lot of companies are are providing for their communities, including um, our, our own. We're trying to figure out what to do. Um, and I think, you know, once that voice comes from a place of, and I want to switch this because authenticity is used so much, but right now I think the tone of generosity is key. Um, and, you know, when grieve is optimistic, that's great. I think, you know, just in the same way that I think it's wonderful that all kinds of yoga are offered and, and you know, I have my preferred, I have my knowledge. Um, it's the same thing with tone. You know, some people might want a more realistic tone. So one of my teachers on Instagram Live um, you know, really 
talks honestly about how this is a trauma, right? This is a collective trauma, individual trauma. It's okay if you're hurting. It's okay if you don't feel great. Um, other people might need like, you know, a little um, cheerleader uh, for their day. So, um, it, you know, without, I think, pivoting too far and seeming um, like you're trying to fish for, for too much and um, having the, the view that, you know, we're, as a PSA, I think, is more of what we're seeing right now and what's working. Do you, do you think, uh, is there, how effective can wellness classes be um, when it's delivered purely digitally? Is there is there something lost in not having the physical space? Um, so when you're practicing together, you know, there's the, the human um, element of oxytocin and, and touch and adjustments um, if they're welcome. Um, but there is still, um, you know, this feeling of community that you can tap into. And, um, you know, once your brain waves get to like a lower level and once your parasympathetic nervous system is still um, calmed with somebody's voice or music or whatever movement it is, um, it can still be effective. Um, of course, I miss being around people and I'm sure a lot of us do. Um, but you know, there, there are still ways to feel like we're together, especially I think in live classes, you still feel like, you know, you're not, um, catching them at a later date. You're, you're really with them in, you know, a virtual room. Yeah. And I've noticed a lot of stories have come out across the country. Um, and I'm sure globally and in the last couple of days about, gyms and and fitness studios and yoga studios um just streaming their like streaming their classes for free and actually opening up these classes that might have been quite pricey and and just putting them out there um i wonder if you think that there is a, a long-term opportunity here if um you know if it might be introducing people to this space um who will stay connected even after the pandemic passes Right. So as long as they're still paying their instructors, I'm, I'm, you know, on board with this. Um, you know, the, you give people access to say the Peloton app for 90 days. Um, you're going to get, have a connection with um, all the teachers. Um, already your brand awareness is up. Um, now, when you do that conversion is going to be interesting, right? So um, are you trying to pump it up at the beginning and seeming insensitive. Uh, but I think, you know, I think most for most of the brands, you know, they're really the fitness brands, they're really um, seeing this as um, a win win opportunity, you know, really being able to showcase like what wellness can do for you, but also being able to reach a wider base and hopefully um, a larger customer base for them in the long run. Yeah. And, you know, I have an interesting question from uh, one of our viewers on LinkedIn. It's Isabel um, Bernier. I apologies if I've butchered that name. Um, but she says, how about, you know, massage therapists, osteopaths, you know, physical therapists, those who touch is such an important part of what they do. Um, do I wonder if you've seen anything there, if they have any recourse. You know, I haven't been able to to speak to um, many massage therapists, but I will say um, Reiki healers, um, you can still do that um, virtually or over technology. So Reiki is this kind of energetic healing. Um, so I think unfortunately for those, um, you know, massages, facials, you know, the physical self-care of haircuts and manicures, pedicures, um, are going to kind of be on pause for a while. Um, but, you know, this is also an opportunity for um, us to get really in touch with ourselves um, and maybe, you know, do self-massage or try putting on a manicure or letting your hair go and letting your hair down for a while. Um, that's that's kind of what I have to say. <laughs> yeah. No, absolutely. And just a, a couple of comments I'll share. Um, Jason Hakes. Uh, said generosity is so needed right now. Really great advice. And then um, uh, Shan Shan Lee uh, said that acknowledging all the feelings and thoughts we have is the first step into accepting what's so. And I think that's a, a big thing too that dovetails with business is the long, you know, if you're leading a business, the longer you're in, in denial, uh, the longer you're, you're, you know, waiting to actually adapt and, and, and move forward. So I think it's so, so important personally and professionally to 
kind of get in touch with those feelings so you can accept what is and then be really smart about how to move forward. So Ko, um, to, to end, I would really love, we always share a bit of advice at the end of this show and I'd really love to, I'd love for you to share um, a piece of wellness advice, maybe something that has helped you sort of stay, uh, stay well and centered during all of this or a resource that our viewers could use. Yeah, um, thank you again to all our viewers who are tuning in. Um, and I really do hope you're well. Um, going back to, you know, the idea of accepting what's happening, whatever is happening. Um, one thing that's helped me is a mantra or a phrase um, that's helped ground me and anchor me. And right now my mantra is okay. Um, you know, I talk with my therapist via Zoom and um, I came up with this mantra over our session um, and it's radical acceptance, like, okay, this is happening, now what? This is happening, so what? This is happening, okay. So I love that for myself right now. If there's something that, you know, appeals to you, um, you know, stick with it. And if it doesn't, if it stops working, then you can switch. Um, there's no right or wrong way right now. Um, you're doing what you can with the resources that you have and my resource for myself right now is my movement practice, my Instagram live, and then this mantra of, okay. I love that co and I'll share what's been working for me. One is I'll say that with, um, I'm a, I'm a calm app subscriber. I've subscribed to them for years. Uh, but actually this week I made the decision to subscribe to Headspace as well. Another meditation app that we mentioned, uh, just because I figure with all the money I'm saving on cooking at home and, not not getting my lunches uh, <laughs> at work every day. Um, I can afford to spend a little more on wellness. Um, and also a, an app that's been uh, an unexpected tool for me has been WhatsApp. And mm. uh, a few friends of mine in the neighborhood uh, started a WhatsApp group called uh, Brooklyn Moms in Quarantine. And it's just a place for us to share resources for working while keeping our kids engaged and a, just a chance to check in with each other. And so I think, um, you know, finding uh, different ways to stay in community um, all day long is is really important. Yeah. It's definitely helped mm -hmm. me. So anyway, so speaking of community, thank you all for joining Ko and I today. Uh, we really appreciate it. Ko, I appreciate you. When you held up your phone, I could see the time was 2.11 a.m. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I really appreciate you staying up late. I, I want you to go to bed right now. Um, get some sleep and we'll look forward to seeing you back in New York really soon. Um, we filmed a lot of great episodes last week that I think are, are still really timely. So you can find other episodes at adweek.com slash together. Uh, we have episodes devoted to retail, to the streaming industry, uh, to the publishing industry. So check those out. And then tomorrow, join us again at one o'clock Eastern time here in the U.S. Uh, 2 a.m. <laughs> in South Korea. And uh, we're going to have our agency's editor, Doug Zanger, joining us from Portland. Um, he's going to be speaking with Maria Scalepi. She is the head of learning and development um, at Mother at that agency. And so they're going to be talking all about agency culture and the jobs outlook right now. So don't miss that one. Um, thanks again for being with us. And I hope that you all have a great day. Bye.